We welcome to Spotlight Dr. Risa Leviso Murray, president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The foundation has supported Spotlight, and with its support, Spotlight will soon release a short issue brief on the intersection between health and poverty. The work recognizes that access to health care is essential, but that many other issues affect well-being, including poverty. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation works across issues of health, everything from health coverage to the supply of health professionals to more immediate issues such as childhood obesity. Out of all of this, what do you think is the most urgent health care problem for low-income Americans today? One of the things we have to keep in mind is that issues of health and health care cut across all economic strata, but the intensity of the problems are often seen most in people who are low-income uh, populations. And so when you ask yourself, what is the most urgent, you have to say, well, how do people stay healthy? And they stay healthy by having access to high-quality health care, by having access to healthy neighborhoods that allow them to live there and choose healthy lifestyles. They stay healthy by having a good sense of the um, factors that allow them to be healthy, like where they live, where they work, the kind of um, food that they eat, and so on. So it's hard to say what is the most urgent uh, or what is the one that we have to focus on the most when we know from all the work that the foundation has done over 30 years that each of these is important. Having access to health care, being able to live in an environment that promotes health, and then being able to access the kind of education and so on that will allow you to use those choices best. So I'm hard pressed to give you just one. The foundation has set a goal of reversing childhood obesity by mm. the year 2015. You've linked high rates of childhood obesity with low-income communities. What is the connection? Obesity, first of all, cuts across a lot of different economic groups, but it's seen much more intensely in low-income populations, in large part because of the communities that they find themselves living in. We know that uh, we all choose what we eat, um, but we're also influenced by the environment that we have around us. And if you look at low-income uh, neighborhoods, they're often characterized by the absence of grocery stores where you can actually get fresh, affordable food, the absence of parks and green spaces where kids can play, the, the absence of choices for healthy food. You see a predominance of fast foods and not other kinds of restaurants and, and options for healthy eating. So when you add all that together, in low-income neighborhoods, often people may want to choose healthier lifestyles that will allow them to maintain a healthy weight, but they don't have the choices available to them. So I think that is one of the main reasons that we see this disproportionate uh, increase in obesity in low-income neighborhoods and why, as a foundation, we've decided to focus on improving the environment uh, as a way of, uh, as a very important strategy to reversing the epidemic of childhood obesity. What specifically do you mean by improving the environment? Creating more green space, better shopping options? So start with the schools, make them opportunities for physical activity and healthy eating. Improve the um, number and the quality of the parks in neighborhoods. There's been a number of studies that show a direct correlation between whether or not you have access to a safe place to play, a park, a recreation center, and how much physical activity you get. And then that is directly related to your body mass index or how heavy you are. So if we invest in the opportunity to be physically active, kids will be more physically active. We also need to think about where low-income families 
um, get access to healthier food, whether it's WIC programs or SNAP programs, those should only provide healthy options for people to eat. So changing the environment and also changing our public policy programs that uh, will enable people to have better access to physical activity and healthy food. Regarding prevention, what is key to include for a federal health care policy to make a difference? Mm. When we talk about prevention, it's a term that's confusing because a lot of people think of prevention as being just clinical prevention, things like mammograms and screening tests for other kinds of cancer, when in fact prevention is much broader than that. And there are some kinds of prevention, like primary prevention of conditions like obesity or uh, never starting to smoke, which we know save money and save lives. So I think a public policy that emphasizes those kinds of preventive strategies that will help us to live a healthier life as a nation are critically important to put into our, our policy agenda. And so those need to focus on what individuals do, not smoking, uh, eating better, getting more physical activity, but also on the community and the population related prevention strategies that will allow an entire community or neighborhood to be healthier. And so we have to think about the policies related to our transportation, related to housing, related to our green spaces. Those are some of the prevention policies that ultimately will allow a community to live healthier. So those two combined, I think, are ones that we have to underscore at the same time we're focusing on the clinical prevention that people talk so much about. I'm a doctor, I'm never gonna tell you that things like mammograms and colonoscopies are unimportant, but we can't focus solely on those when there are these other aspects of prevention that will help the nation live a healthier life. Besides increasing access, what aspects of health care reform do you think are most important now to low-income Americans? Mm -hmm. For so many low-income Americans, they don't have access to coverage, and that is fundamental. If you don't have access to coverage, chances are you're not going to get anywhere near the kind of quality care that you need for chronic illnesses, much less preventive care, or the kind of catastrophic care that we all hope we won't need. So it is essential that we have coverage, and we have coverage that is affordable and is comprehensive enough to provide the kinds of services that people need, ranging from prevention to mental health care to catastrophic care, as I said. Secondly, um, it's very important for low-income uh, populations to have a high value in the health care that they get. That is a good quality care for the price that they can pay. Who more needs the health care to be uh, high quality than someone who's trying to make every dollar count? And in our health care system now, we just aren't delivering the value of care that we should. We pay way more than any other country, and we don't get the kind of outcomes that we should. And those outcomes are often lowest among low-income populations. So we need to improve the coverage. We need to make sure that we focus on the quality of care that's being delivered in low-income uh, neighborhoods and in, no, uh, in two low-income populations. And third, I think we've got to make sure that we are attentive to the equity of the care that we deliver. All too often, there are disparities in, in care that is delivered in low-income populations, and that's just unacceptable.